Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm David Wu. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big story shaping the world today. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who's just interested in learning about what makes our world tick. Please subscribe at davidwombound.com if you haven't done so already. Everyone has a favorite sport. Mine is tennis. I love playing tennis. I love watching tennis. And what happened in the tennis world this week made me really proud of my sport. The threat by the Women's Tennis Association to pull tournaments out of China over the disappearance of the Chinese tennis player Pen Shui showed the sport is willing to put the safety and well-being of one of its own before money. The well-wishing for Pen across the tennis world from Naomi Osaka to Roger Federer was heartfelt without being political. For Xi Jinping's own sake, I hope he doesn't make the mistake of trying to make the story go away. Powerful men abuse young women everywhere in the world. People won't think any less of China if she were to simply admit that this could also happen in China. However, if she denies Pun the due process that she deserves and makes her disappear even, then he risks turning this issue into a political indictment of the Chinese system that he's so proud of. Let's hope she thinks straight. Because if he doesn't, I suspect that the support for boycotting the Winter Olympic in China in February will only grow, and so will China's international isolation. So not worth it, if you ask me. Turning to the program this week, I want to talk about Germany. I want to talk about what is ailing Germany, the many problems that Germany is facing, some of which are set to get much worse in the coming weeks. I want to talk about why these issues, together with the French election next spring, are likely to force the ECB, the European Central Bank, to play defense on the inflation while others trying to play offense. I want to talk about why I continue to like selling the euro against the US dollar. I also want to talk about why I think the market remains mistaken about the probability of a Brainerd-led Federal Reserve next year. Okay. I think the market should not make the mistake of assuming that Manchin's politeness means weakness. I think the Fed in general could surprise in December by being more hawkish than is priced in. For that reason, I continue to like higher vol and higher U.S. real interest rates. The Purchasing Managers Index is one of the most popular leading indicators for advanced economies, especially for the Eurozone. And currently, the PMI is certainly giving the impression that the recovery in the Eurozone has legs. Just look at this chart here. Italy's number currently at 61 puts it ahead of even the U.S. And Germany is currently keeping pace with that of the U.K. and Canada. Even France, okay, using this measure as head of Japan and China. Reinforcing this is the fact that another good leading indicator for the Eurozone, the Eurozone Economic Sentiment Indicator, is currently near its all-time high. But something doesn't feel right. Let's take a look at Eurozone's new car registrations. As you can see on this chart, this number has been going down pretty much through all of 2021, even during the summer when we saw a reopening of the Eurozone economies as COVID temporarily receded. Meanwhile, German consumer spending growth looks like it's sputtering. Just look at this chart right here. There's no doubt in the last three or four months, while U.S. consumer spending growth has been reaccelerating, in Germany, the opposite has been going on. What is going on here? Incredibly, last month, German retail sales, in nominal terms, contracted nearly 0.5% on a year-on-year -year comparison. The contrast against the U.S. that grew 16% during the same period could not have been any more dramatic. There is no question that German consumers remain extremely cautious. The question, of course, is why? And yet the Germans have every reason to be optimistic, certainly more optimistic than other people. 
I mean, just look at the numbers. If you look at the left-hand side chart of the slide, you've got the German unemployment rate, which is you know, currently near the lowest level in 10 years, which is currently one of the lowest in the world. And the spike we saw during COVID has largely reversed. If you look at the right-hand side chart, you can see the German household debt as a share of you know, GDP is barely above 80%, which is lower than that of the US, which is only half of that of Australia. Some cultures value certainty more than others. There is no question, at least at the moment, Germany faces very high level of policy uncertainty, at least relative to other countries, as you can see on this chart. Now, this largely stems from the fact that almost a month following the federal elections, it is still not yet clear that the three parties that are currently negotiating for forming a coalition government, that is the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Free Democrats, what have they exactly agreed on? Or rather, better put, what can they actually agree on, okay, given the disparities in their views when it comes to economics, social policies, and even foreign policies? In my opinion, Germany massively benefited from the stability associated with the Merkel government of the last 16 years, the constancy and the predictability of her policies introduce certainty, and certainty encourage investment and risk-taking. And in fact, there's a reason why she is by far the most popular politician, not only in Germany today, but also Okay, in the world today, as shown in the latest Pew Research survey that came out last month, I think Germany will not be the same without Merkel. And I think the Germans know that. Another important policymakers in Germany who will be soon buying out, of course, is the Bundesbank president, Jan Wigman. Wigman is a controversial character in Europe, and he certainly does not have too many friends in Brussels. But in Germany, he happens to enjoy fairly strong public support for his being tough on inflation. I think he's going to be missed. In fact, maybe greatly missed. In fact, I suspect many Germans are going to be wondering, okay, now that inflation is about 4% and Dr. Weidman will be soon gone, who is going to be fighting, okay, in Germany's corner at the European Central Bank? to ensure that the inflation genie is not let out of the bottle. If you don't believe me, just look at Google Trends. You'll see that in Germany there's been a surge in terms of number of Google searches of the term stagflation. Let's remind ourselves that Germany has a unique history when it comes to inflation, that Germans have spent the last 60 years blaming inflation for everything that happened okay, in the Second World War. Okay. I suspect that rising inflation is going to be more unsettling and more destabilizing for the Germans than for most other people. Meanwhile, COVID's new wave is hitting Europe hard. Take a look at this chart here. Austria, the current epicenter of the COVID outbreak in Europe, is already seeing number of new cases per day that exceeded even the peak number that we saw in Israel this past summer. Moreover, as you can see, except for Italy, none of Austria's neighbors has managed to basically escape from the same fate. Even in Germany, okay, the number of cases recently hit a record high. I suspect the numbers will keep climbing, okay, most likely north of a thousand per million people before this thing is over. The only high frequency data we have about how the outbreak is affecting, you know, consumption, especially when it comes to going out, are the open table seated diners based the comparison relative to 2019. You can see just in Germany, just in the last two weeks, that number, which is in gray, has literally taken a big dive. It was, you know, growing at about 20% and it's now basically below zero. Meanwhile, German regulators this week found an excuse to delay the approval process for Nord Stream 2. 
the pipeline that will deliver natural gas directly from Russia to Germany. Now, honestly, I still cannot figure out why they decided to delay. Okay, is it because the pressure from the U.S. has become overwhelming? Okay, is it because that Merkel decided to leave the political hot potato to the next government? Whatever the reason is, the timing could not have been any worse. Natural gas price jumped 30% immediately on the back of the German decision. In case you don't know, natural gas price has already gone up 600% year to date. Weather forecasting is no easier than economic forecasting. But one thing we can probably count on when it comes to this coming winter is that most likely is going to be under the influence of La Nina, much like was the case last winter. As you can see on the chart here, the Southern Oscillation Index is definitely putting us firmly in the La Nina territory. What this means is that stronger trade wind basically will blow warm water at the surface of the Eastern Pacific westward, and this will bring up the colder water in the deep sea to the surface in the east. What this means is that La Nina is often associated with colder than normal winter in the northern atmosphere, especially in the U.S. East Coast and Midwest, and to some extent in Europe as well. Right now, the forecast for Europe is that the second half of the winter will be colder than normal, although there's still a lot of uncertainty there, especially regarding to what's going to happen to the polar vortex as, we, as the winter months start to unfold. Needless to say, if this winter turns out to be colder than normal, the natural gas crisis that's currently you know, raging in Europe could potentially represent a massive hit to purchasing power in Europe and with negative economic consequences. As though these problems are not bad enough already, the German economy is also now struggling to countenance the slowdown of the Chinese economy which is hitting German export particularly hard. As you can see on this chart, German export has been decelerating sharply over the last few months, despite a relatively weak euro. This is the reason why I think the consensus forecast for eurozone growth outlook remains too optimistic. As you can see on this chart here, okay, Wall Street consensus forecast for the eurozone next year is 4% plus GDP growth, which I think is much too high, okay, especially given the possibility that the supply bottlenecks associated with the shutdown in China could potentially drag into next year and hurting Germany's manufacturing recovery. The ECB recently tried to assuage public concerns about rising inflation by dialing back its asset purchase program. But as you can see on this chart, Okay, you know, the level of monthly purchases remain still quite high, in fact, higher than where it was six months ago. So from that point of view, any, you know, adjustment has been no more than cosmetic, to say the least. I suspect that given the worsened economic outlook for the Eurozone in the next few months, I think given the fact that core inflation in the Eurozone still relatively low compared with, let's say, U.S. and some of the other economies, and considering the fact that, you know what, the bothersome Yen Weeman will be soon gone, I suspect the ECB most likely will be sitting on its hand for a very long time. Certainly is likely to lag other major central banks when it comes to normalizing interest rates. Because guess what? About the only thing the ECB can hope for is for the euro to continue to fall in order for Germany to regain competitiveness as a source of economic growth. I said a few months ago that the upcoming French presidential election to be held next April is going to be huge, and in fact it has the potential to change the future of Europe. I still feel very much the same, and I suspect that Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, might feel the same way. The reality is if you look at the numbers, the election is going to be far closer than was the case back in 2017. And there's also no doubt with the emergence of Eric Zemmour as basically another competitor coming from the extreme right, that someone like Lagarde 
probably is getting a little bit worried that this might actually lead to overturning the status quo. From that point of view, I strongly suspect that it's another reason why the ECB is going to sit tight and not do anything that could potentially spoil Macron's chance for re-election. The euro has been one of the worst performing currencies in 2021 so far. And there's no doubt if you look at speculative positioning, the market is already quite short the euro. But still, I do think that there is plenty of room for the down trend to continue. I think 110 is a fairly conservative target. I still like selling euro dollar at these levels. And I certainly think that we could see 110 before the year is over. Let me give you a quick update of some of my other views. Over the past week, the market has upped the probability of a brainer led Fed. Okay, all you have to do is look at, you know, predicted.com, where, you know, the odds of Lyle Brainer becoming the next Fed chair has risen to one third versus Powell at two thirds. I cannot rule out that somebody knows something that I don't. I've been in this business long enough to know that inside information sometimes can be quite decisive. Except on this occasion, I don't have any inside information. I'm, my argument rests on the assumption that the only way for Live Brainer to get confirmed by the Senate is if she gets the support from Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. And guess what? Manchin met with Powell this week. Afterwards, he said that he thought that Powell was looking rather favorably. Oh, wow. Okay, it's true that Manchin also agreed to Biden's request to meet with Lyle Brainard next week. But to me, what is also interesting is the fact that he said he'll meet with Powell as a follow-up meeting afterwards. Okay, you know what? Joe Manchin is a nice guy. He's from West Virginia after all. Okay, the fact that he's polite enough to agree to meet with Brainard. I think does not mean that he's changed his mind about the risk to inflation. I still think that he's already made up his mind. He's now just trying to look reasonable by meeting with Brainard. I suspect that Powell is going to be the next chair. I also suspect that Powell is less dovish than he looks. Even more important than what Joe Manchin said about Jerome Powell last week was what, you know, Richard Clary, the, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve, my former PhD dissertation advisor, okay, said about inflation. Rich said it may very well be appropriate to discuss accelerating the pace at which the Fed is winding down its Fed purchase program, and that this discussion can come as early as the December meeting. Wow. Okay. Adding to this is, you know, Christopher Waller, a Fed governor, in other words, a voting member of the FOMC, who said on Friday, we may need to pivot to a faster tapering on high inflation rating. All this, of course, you know, is completely consistent with what James Bullard, the St. Louis Reserve Fed president, has been saying for a while. And Bullard is going to be a voting member, okay, in 2022. All this would suggest if we continue to get strong data, especially if we get another basically set of uh, strong non-bond payroll number, I think we could potentially see faster, basically acceleration of tapering that might end in three months as opposed to six months. Undoubtedly, the possibility that we might see an acceleration in the pace of tapering was the main reason why U.S. 10-year real yields bounced off its record low on Friday. As I've been saying for a while, okay, U.S. 10-year real yield really ought to be viewed as the real barometer of the monetary policy stance basically over the course of 2022. Against this backdrop, not surprisingly, VIX is up now three days in a row, with VXX now almost back to 21. What is really striking about the stock market at the moment is just to what extent the breadth of the equity market rallying is faltering as we speak. In fact, if you look at this chart right here, this is the New York Stock Exchange 52-week highs versus 52-week lows. 
The number hit basically a negative 20 on Friday. The last time we saw such low numbers was actually when the stock market was actually falling back in September. The fact that the stock market right now is still at record high and the breadth is faltering, I think that has to be seen as a major concern for the equity bull. Just to recap, I think Powell's going to get renominated maybe as early as next week. And I think this is going to force the market to price out some of the dovishness that would be associated with a brainer led Fed. And that should basically ultimately amount to higher real yields. I also think that oil has been equal. I think there is definitely a more than 50 percent chance we will see accelerated basically a pace in tapering that could come as early as December, okay? The only thing that could possibly, okay, upset this view is either we get a massive, basically, a surge in COVID cases in the U.S. between now and then. While that, I think, is not unlikely, I think that's still lower than 50-50, okay? The second, basically, risk Okay, to my view, which is more real, is the possibility that, you know, that the debt ceiling, which has to be raised by December 15, turn out to be a bigger issue than it would be otherwise. All in all, I think, you know, but even if these two risks were to materialize, that means higher volatility, higher VIX, and probably a stronger dollar as well. So nothing to lose there. The bottom line here is that I think you can do a lot worse than moving some money to the sideline into cash, at least ahead of December. Before we wrap up the program, let's just go through my honest board very quickly. I'm still short euro dollar from basically 116. This trade is obviously up. I told you before I still like the trade. I'm, I was long basically uh, Exxon Mobil from 64, which is more or less flat, slightly down. Okay. I'm long basically uh, VXX, which I established at 2125, more or less flat from basically the opening level. And I'm long 10 year real yields enter at uh, basically about uh, 103 basis point. I'm somewhat down, seven basis point down. All in all, not a bad result. I'm still holding out for basically for these trades to basically finally do their thing. Talk to you next week.